Welcome back to Bishop Aquatics. Today we're mixing things up a bit. As some of you might know, I'm not just into aquariums and fish, I'm also a writer. And I'm super excited to share another chapter from my book, Exalted. If you haven't checked out chapter one yet, you might want to give it a listen to get the full story. In this chapter, we will follow David as he deals with some pretty intense memories and faces a new dangerous mission in the city. There's a lot of action, suspense, and some supernatural twists. So get ready for a wild ride. All right, let's jump into chapter two of Exalted. Enjoy. Chapter two, awaking in a cold sweat, a sickly sweet taste lingering in my mouth, my heart hammering away like it's trying to break free from my chest. It's always like this when the shadows of the past creep into the edges of my consciousness. I reach for the comfort of a breathing technique that has served me well in the past. Breathe in. One, two, three. Breathe out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The rhythmic pattern helps to calm my racing thoughts. If only temporarily. I know that the more I resist these memories, the stronger their grip becomes. So instead of fighting against them, I allow myself to be immersed in the recollection of those fateful days in the Undercity. It's a necessary evil. Confronting my past head-on is the only way to move forward. Leaving it behind for good, the cadence of each breath becomes a mantra. A simple act that anchors me in the present. Breathe in, breathe out. I repeat the cycle. Each measured breath, a step away from the haunting memories of the Undercity. The room gradually stops spinning, the clamor in my mind subsiding. The breathing technique, the simple yet potent tool I use to center myself in reality. Breathe in, breathe out. The sickly taste begins to dissipate, my heartbeat steadying. The cold sweat retreats, leaving a damp residue on my skin. I lie there for a moment, eyes closed still caught between the tendrils of the past and the clarity of the present. I feel my heart gradually returning to a near-normal pace, the pulsing in my chest settling into a more manageable tempo. I briefly wonder if this unsettling bout of memories is an ill omen for the job that lies ahead. Nevertheless, I push the thought aside, reaching for my phone, a flicker of artificial light illuminating the room as I press the button. The display happily informs me that it's 2.38 a.m., a time when most sane people are lost in the blissful embrace of dreams. I consider the impenetrable darkness outside. The world is asleep, unaware of the peculiar tasks that await me. With one final deep breath, I push myself up from the makeshift bed. The creaking of the floor beneath me, a reminder that I'm still here, still breathing. The inner city may haunt my dreams. But the present demands my attention, and for now, the simple act of breathing is my anchor to sanity. I stand to stretch the satisfying pop of joints, providing a welcome distraction from the lingering tension. Damn bed, I think to myself. That's what I get for sleeping like a caveman. I grab my trusted Browning 9mm pistol, tucking it securely into my waistband. Its presence serves as a comforting reassurance against the uncertainties of the night. The cold metal presses against my skin reminding me that even though this city may be different from the Undercity, danger still lurks in the shadows. I carry it as a constant reminder of what happened there. It will be there to protect me when needed, just like it always has been. My backpack, a silent accomplice filled with an assortment of tools, sits patiently in the corner. With a swift motion, I sling it over my shoulder. The faint clinking of its contents, a subdued sound of preparation. Time to get to work, I remind myself glancing around the dimly lit room one last time before venturing into the dark night. As I step out, the door creaks, protesting its rusted hinges. The city outside is quiet, an eerie calm blanketing the streets. The cool air hits me like a physical force as I emerge from my sanctuary, a reminder of the world that lies beyond these walls. It's a harsh contrast to the warm safety inside, but it's also invigorating. Each breath draws in not just oxygen, but courage. Or at least that's what I tell myself. By the time I approach the highway, my iron horse is fully heated, its mechanical heart ready to roar, as if sending a message to everyone else on the road. Get out of the way if you know what's good for you. I pull onto the on-ramp, 
giving the throttle everything it has. Gravity tugs at me, the speed climbing with greater intensity with each passing second. I saw past a sleek Tesla, effortlessly merging over, downshifting, leveling off my speed to a more reasonable degree. The wind roars around me as if trying to keep up or challenge my speed, but it's futile. Tonight at least, the road belongs to me. The cityscape unfolds before me, in a blur of neon lights, shadows cast by towering buildings, pierce the night sky like jagged teeth. As I continue down the highway, my heart races in anticipation. The address is located deep within the business district, surrounded by nondescript office buildings that seem to blend into the cityscape like camouflaged soldiers waiting for their orders. These structures have a habit of swallowing people whole, demanding soul-crushing, nine to five days, stifling individuality with every brick and window. It's the kind of place where you don't know what happens on the floor above or below you. You've never even thought to care. Perfect for running an illicit operation. Whatever that may be. Come to think of it, I still have no idea what exactly I'm supposed to be looking for, or who I'm taking it from. But one thing is certain. This could be the easiest payday of my life if everything goes according to plan. As the thought crosses my mind, I find myself repeating it like a mantra, hoping that simply uttering these words will somehow ensure their truthfulness. The city lights blur into streaks of neon as I race toward the heart of the business district. The engine's roar drowns out the nagging uncertainties, leaving only the rush of the wind and the pulsating hum of the road. Thirty blissful minutes later, I pull off the highway. Not far now, I mutter to myself, the anticipation building as the destination draws near. Riding by the location to scope the area, I make a mental check mark of the building, noting its entrances before continuing down the street. The area is mostly quiet, the normal office workers having long gone home, seeking solace in their vices to forget the day's monotony. A few office lights in various buildings stubbornly persist a testament to the hard workers or, at least, those who convince themselves of their dedication. The city streets are not completely deserted. A handful of drifters wander aimlessly, mostly invisible to the passing world. Not that they possess any kind of supernatural power. It's just that people prefer not to pay attention to such things. They certainly won't believe any stories of impossible occurrences they might happen to tell. I, too, don't fit into this scene. I'm the odd puzzle piece in a world of mundane routines and predictable lives. As I navigate the quiet streets, the city lights casting long shadows around me, I can't help but revel in the anonymity that cloaks my presence. In the underbelly of society is where I thrive, unseen and unheard, a ghost in the shadows of the business district. My motorcycle rumbles beneath me, a steady companion. With every passing moment, the sense of the unknown grows more palpable. I take a deep breath, feeling the crisp night air filling my lungs, stealing myself for whatever awaits. I pull into an alleyway cloaked in total darkness, a few blocks away killing the engine, the lingering rumble fading into the quiet of the night. The building I seek isn't far. The shadows between the light posts create a natural path for me to stick to. It never hurts to be a little extra cautious, something I've learned the hard way. I casually, confidently make my way to the building, gliding through the darkness but not shying away from the occasional pools of light. Acting like you belong is a skill that often works wonders, a lesson learned through countless encounters in the murky world I navigate. As I near the building, I spot an entirely unremarkable overweight security guard through the perfectly polished large glass doors. A typical sight for office buildings, these places often rely on an illusion of security at night. The doors usually aren't locked, allowing janitorial staff to come or go. They have some monitors with a security guard who can dial the police as their superpower. I didn't want to resort to violence, especially against someone who likely had nothing to do with my current job. I activate my subtle ability, manipulating the perception of those around me to simply not see me. The invisible cloak of perception manipulation enveloping me as I confidently walk right in through the front door. The security guard doesn't even turn to look, casually saying, ID, without shifting his gaze. I walk over to the desk, curious about what has captured his attention so thoroughly that he didn't even bother looking up. One of the monitors is playing some kind of cartoon, in another language subtitled. It looks like a typical cartoon, 
but the content is clearly meant for adults. Not receiving his usual response, the security guard breaks his intense focus away from the show, only to find an empty lobby. He shrugs, turns to the monitor, displaying all the CCTV footage, spotting me standing right over his shoulder. My trick doesn't work on cameras. To them, I'm standing there plain as day. The security guard jumps as if he's seen a ghost. Well, I suppose to him he has. Unfortunately, his feet were propped against the desk. So when he does a full-body jerk, he sends himself flying backward. His chair tips over, sending him headfirst into the wall with an audible thud. Poor guy knocked himself unconscious. Not quite what I was planning, but good enough, I mutter to myself, bending down to act like I'm helping the security guard back into his chair. If anyone reviews the footage later, they'll think this guy was seriously distracted and scared himself unconscious. Okay, I'm in the building, now to the top floor. Easy enough so far. Maybe my luck is starting to change after all. I glance around the lobby spotting both an elevator and access stairs. I make my way to the stairs, making sure to project an air of confidence for the watchful eyes of the cameras. It's not uncommon for someone to use the stairs. The illusion of fitness is always a good cover. Or so I keep hearing. I open the heavy metal door, stepping into the stairwell. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but everything seems perfectly normal. As I ascend the staircase, a persistent unease wraps around me like an invisible shroud. Questions linger, their answers elusive. Why would Prescott, a man known for utilizing his own resources, hire an outsider for a seemingly straightforward task? The allure of an exorbitant pay rate only deepens the mystery. My instincts, finely tuned from years of navigating the shadows, raise an alarm. A subtle itch in the recesses of my mind that refuses to be ignored. I dismiss the nagging uncertainty. Now is not the time for second guessing. I charge up the dimly lit stairs that stretch ahead. Doors to other floors fly by, but my pace remains unbroken. The words written on the paper appear in my head. A silent guide, leading me with an insistence that drives me onward up toward the pinnacle of this building. Senses on high alert. I attune myself to the environment. The cadence of my footsteps transforms into a rhythmic drumbeat, drowning out the disquieting thoughts that threaten to invade my concentration. The ascent continues, the specter of disquiet trailing me like a shadow. I shake it off, a seasoned professional dismissing the tendrils of uncertainty, familiar companions in my perilous line of work. The twentieth floor greets me. I'm more than slightly winded. A fiery burn in my legs testifying to the climb. My hand steadying itself on the doorknob lingers for a moment as I gather my composure. Showtime, my internal mantra reminds me as I thrust the door open. Stepping into the unknown, an assault on my senses unfolds. An acrid smell. A grotesque amalgamation of rotting meat, burning oil, and industrial-grade chemical. It permeates every inch of the space a taste clinging to the back of my throat. The urge to retch surges within, restrained only by sheer willpower. The earlier nagging sensation, now a crescendo, demands my attention. Screaming that I should not be here, the room unfurls before me, an eerie collage of unsettling sights. Shadows dance across the walls, playing tricks on the eye. The air is thick with an oppressive atmosphere making me feel like an uninvited guest in this theater of death. My trained instincts, normally a reliable guide, falter in the face of this unexpectedly disorienting reality. I center myself, banishing extraneous thoughts. Focus. Execute the task at hand. Worry about the intricacies later. My gaze lifts, revealing a hallway devoid of doors, offices, or any discernible features just... An endless expanse leading to a right turn at the far end. Proceeding cautiously, an electrifying tension fills the air. Every fiber of my being poised on high alert. My browning emerges from my waistband. I deftly flick off the safety. A calculated move to avoid the pitfalls of the earlier fool. Firearms. Instruments of death. Demand respect. As the cold steel settles into my grip... I silently acknowledge that this tool is meant for a purpose. When wielded it demands mastery. The noxious odor intensifies with every step. 
an olfactory assault that threatens to etch itself permanently into my memory. My back presses against the wall, a strategic move to minimize exposure. I cautiously peer around the impending corner. Confusion morphs into visceral horror as the scene before me unfolds like a nightmare. This entire part of the building, which should be full of offices or cubicle farms, defies all expectations. All the surfaces emit a faintly glowing pale white-pink flesh color that appeared to be breathing, as if the very structure of the space is alive. Tubes and wires snake everywhere, twisting, then doubling back on themselves into incomprehensible shapes that hurt to look at, as if they shouldn't exist in the first place. On tables lie people, the lucky ones obviously dead, dismembered, then discarded. The unlucky ones are still alive, tethered to the tubes, various liquids being pumped into and out of them. These poor souls endure unimaginable agony, left conscious to suffer every agonizing second until death claims them. One of them noticed me silently, mouthing the words, Kill me. I can't even fathom the purpose of all this madness. In the center of the room stands a large cube-shaped object, an abomination of flesh combined with machine in an unholy union. To hell with whatever Prescott and Cross want. This ends now. The speaking man's eyes fixate on me. The unmistakable look of suffering etched across his face. I tread on the squishy yielding floor, making my way toward him. The only mercy I can offer is a single bullet to the head, a swift release from his torment. As his body goes limp, a fleeting expression of gratitude washes over his face. The fluid stopped pumping, then every alarm in the world seemed to go off at once. The surreal horror of the scene is almost too much to bear, my mind struggling to comprehend the grotesque fusion of flesh machinery surrounding me. I glance around the room, taking in the twisted nightmare that defies all reason. It's clear that whatever sinister experiment is happening here, it goes beyond the boundaries of morality, much less sanity. In the midst of the chaos, my eyes catch a glint of something unusual. An artifact of unknown origin, resting on a nearby table. Instinctively, I grab it, the cold metal providing an eerie contrast to the grotesque warmth of the room. Over the blaring alarms, the thunder of footsteps reverberates down a hallway opposite to where I entered. I must have been blind to miss it before a concealed passage leading to another large room. The guards are charging down the hallway at me. I recognize the outfits. They're part of Cross. However, something is terribly wrong. Their bodies seem to move, shifting under their skin. Powered by pistons, their eyes glowing with inhuman energy, radiating anger. What in the fuck is happening? I audibly say to myself. This one charges into the room, spots me, unleashing an inhuman scream full of fury of hate all directed at me. I snap my browning into position, taking aim at its chest, and shoot twice. The first shot hits center mass with a loud twang of metal hitting metal. The second shot lands right in its glowing left eye, the head snapping back with a wet crunch, the body going limp, falling to the ground. In the chaos, I mutter, shit, 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 while turning to run back to the stairwell. Stuffing the artifact frantically into my pocket as I go, the sound of pounding footsteps and the grinding of mechanical parts were growing louder behind me. I dare not look back. I knew it wouldn't help anything. In what feels like an eternity, but couldn't have been more than a dozen seconds, I reach the stairwell door, flinging it open just as one of the inhuman bastards throws itself at my back, knocking me forward. My own momentum, mixed with the shove, sends me flying face first down the flight of stairs, landing hard on my stomach. The breath is knocked out of me. I panic, unable to draw in a breath. I don't care how much combat experience you have. When you can't breathe, your body just doesn't listen. The monstrosity lands next to me, giving me my first close look. It was human at some point, but it's more machine than man now. It wore clothes, but everything was wrong glistening red metal claws instead of hands, pale, colorless skin, eyes devoid of humanity, filled only with cold hatred. More of them crowd into the stairwell, but there isn't room for all of them in the narrow space. The closest one shrieks, kicking me hard enough to lift me off the ground. I cry out in pain, feeling a sickening crunch as I land, unable to breathe right with a tight pain in my chest. I think a rib just punctured my lung. Not good. 
The assault continues as it reaches down to pick me up, grabbing my backpack. Luckily, it didn't count on my thrifty shopping. Its sharp, clawed hands ripping through the straps into my skin. It howls in frustration, kicking again, sending me tumbling down the second flight of stairs. I felt my back against the door. The world was now spinning, my sight fading in and out, pain radiating from all over my body. I feel blood collecting under me. My blood. I'll be damned if I die in an office. What a funny last thought. I raise my head to see half a dozen of the creatures descending. I let my gaze fall back down, noticing my browning landed next to me. How had I forgotten about that? I quickly reach over, rearming myself while gasping at the pain such a simple movement caused. These creatures may be mean as hell, but they aren't smart. Ten bullets. Six targets. Not bad odds. Even for me. I take aim as best I can, then unleash all of my remaining rounds in a smooth pattern, calmly moving from the closest one to the furthest. I blink in disbelief. I did it. They aren't moving. I am. Sort of. Amidst the eerily still figures, my senses slowly return, the agony in my chest intensifying with each labored breath. It's a temporary victory at best. The odds are stacked against me. The creatures may be momentarily incapacitated, but their resilience is unnerving. As I struggle to push myself up, a realization dawns upon me. The browning is empty. All my spare magazines are in my now-gone backpack. The creatures, refusing to stay down, begin to stir again at this exact moment. Limbs jerking into unnatural positions, lifeless eyes flickering with malevolence. My body protests at every movement, but I can't afford to stay down. Survival demands action, and my options are dwindling. I struggle to my feet, using the wall for support. Everything hurts. I have no idea about the extent of my injuries, but I know I'm bleeding from the wet, warm feeling running down my body. That's when the all-too-familiar howl of rage pierces the air from above. There are more of them, and I'm out of ammo and fight. Giving up seems tempting, admitting defeat, but I've never been a quitter. I don't intend to start now. I make my way down the stairs as fast as I can manage. Think, David. Think. There has to be a way out of this. Am I really going to die? To a bunch of psychos, with blenders for hands. The inhuman screams of rage started to draw closer. I've given it everything I have by the time I make it one more flight down. Then I noticed it. I'm not sure how I missed it before. I should have noticed it. It's the kind of thing you don't overlook. There's an entrance to the Undercity on this floor, but it's not on this floor. It's outside, 17 stories high. The realization hits me like a thunderbolt, sparking a flicker of hope. I can make it to the entrance, maybe escape to the Undercity, throwing these things off my trail. It's a risky move, but it's the only one I've got left. I push myself harder, pain be damned, heading toward the potential escape route. It's been five long years since I came to Earth, ever since I've had the ability to sense when an entrance to the Undercity is nearby. Entrances to the Undercity are fickle, appearing and disappearing without much reason. This unpredictability often leads people to stumble into the Undercity by accident, finding themselves in a different place than expected. Sometimes these entrances reappear in the same location, sparking public attention fueling rumors akin to the Bermuda Triangle. Then there are the fixed locations, typically situated on points of power. The ley lines of the world. These are claimed by various factions, rendering them inaccessible to individuals like me. Not that I have any desire to return. I fled from certain death, but now it seems a different form of demise is catching up with me on Earth. I briefly contemplate which death would be worse before settling on the one that comes later. I push the door open, walking down the hallway. Desperation fueled determination, pushing me toward the uncertain escape route. Step, drip, step, drip, step. I take a dozen steps, then turn to face the window, sensing the entrance outside the building. Hovering in midair, it's like being a very confused bird that finds itself suddenly in a strange place. A chuckle escapes my lips, the brain playing tricks on the edge of death. I raise my hand, the browning still in it, smashing the window with the last reserves of energy in me. Office building windows are supposed to be made of reinforced safety glass, designed to withstand the pressures of office life. 
Apparently, whoever installed this particular window missed that memo because it shatters instantly. I smile. Finally, some good luck. See, kids never throw your gun down if you run out of bullets. It's a great hammer and a pinch. Man, I must be losing it. The wind rushes in a reminder of how breezy it can get at this height. I peek my head out of the newly created opening, sensing the entrance at about the same height as the floor. A few inches away, I prepare myself to fall, hesitating for only a second, and let go. In that moment, dozens of the monstrosities burst from the stairwell, charging with murderous glee in their eyes. Not this time, fuckers, I shout, as I feel a brief sensation of weightlessness. Then everything fades to black. Thanks for listening to Chapter 2 of Exalted. I hope you enjoyed it. David's really going through a lot, isn't he? From grappling with his past to diving headfirst into a risky new mission, things are getting intense. So, what did you think about his way of coping with those intense flashbacks? How about that eerie scene in the office building? What do you think Prescott is really up to? Also, what's your take on those creepy part machine guards? I think they kind of upped the stakes. Drop your thoughts in the comments below. I'd love to hear your theories and reactions. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out when I drop the next chapter. If you have any questions about the book or my writing process, feel free to ask. I love chatting with you guys. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time on Bishop Aquatics. God bless you all.